Um, it's been an incredible sermon series. Uh, it's been a difficult one. Uh, I'll, I'll say it from my end, in preparing this, it's taken me to some really dark places. Uh, and it's made me realize the, the, the darkness that lives in the human heart, that separated from Christ, we are some very, very, very dark people who do very dark things. Uh, but there is hope. There is hope. Um, and for us who are on this side of Jesus' death and resurrection, we look to the cross. If you've ever wondered, is there hope as I navigate through the challenges of life and the darkness that is out there and the darkness that is in here? There is hope. And that hope is found in Jesus Christ. And so I've really, really enjoyed this sermon series. But we are uh, coming to the end. Um, we're almost there. We're almost there. And so this morning, we're going to talk uh, about Samson, uh, probably the most well-known judge. Uh, most people would be familiar with the story of Samson and Delilah uh, and his hair and his strength and the fact that he tears lions apart like a man tears a donkey apart, which is super weird. I didn't know that was a thing, that people were out there doing that. But, but we are familiar with the story of Samson. And there's a lot in there. Judges chapter 13 to 16 is where we find the events of Samson. There's a lot happening in there. And I don't have time to unpack every single nugget. In fact, I want to encourage you after this service, this gathering, this sermon, to go back home and to read this for yourself. You spend some time in these chapters because there's a lot going on here, but I'm just going to give you a little bit. But before we do that, uh, permit me to pray. I'm going to pray for you. I ask that you pray for me, that God would do that which only he can do, and that is save many. And so, Father, we, we thank you for your word. Uh, it is living and active. And so, Lord, I pray that it would cut deep, but that it would also heal, that it would restore, that it would save. And so would you meet each and every one of us where we are? We ask all of this in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. Here's the interesting thing uh, about Judges 13 to 16, the interesting thing about Samson, is that this is the first time in the book of Judges that the Israelites don't cry out to God for deliverance. If you read this slowly, you'll pick that up. That they don't cry out to God for deliverance. Well, why is that? Well, things have taken quite a turn. You see, now the, the, the danger is not their destruction. The danger is their assimilation. Is that they have now assimilated to the culture. That, that, that the oppression is coming in a different way. I think this is very relevant for us today. See, we don't live in a context where, where our faith will get us jailed. The persecution is different. Our danger is assimilation, that we become one with the culture to the point where we don't feel that we need God. This is where they find themselves. It's important for us to know that. The other thing that I think we should know before we jump into the text uh, is that Samson was a Nazarite. He was a Nazarite. Now, you might be sitting here going, what on earth is that? Well, I'm glad you asked. A, a, a Nazarite was one who was set apart. They, they would set themselves apart for God. You can read all about this in Numbers chapter 6. You, you could become a Nazarite. You could say, listen, I, I want to, for a time frame, for a season, I, I want to set myself apart. And there, there were three things, a few more, but three key things that you were not allowed to do in that season. You weren't allowed to cut your hair. You couldn't drink any form of alcohol. And you couldn't touch anything that was unclean, anything that was dead, decaying. You, you just couldn't, right? So three things. Don't cut your hair, don't drink any alcohol, and don't touch or eat anything that's unclean. Now, what's interesting about Samson is that he didn't make this decision on his own. If we read Judges chapter 13, we see that he was called to be a Nazarite from birth. Uh, in scripture, there's two other individuals that we could say had the same thing. One is Samuel, and the other one is John the Baptist. All right? So only three in the scriptures that we find who, who were born as Nazarites. But how it usually worked is that you would say, hey, for a particular time frame, this is the life I now want to live. On why are you telling us this? Because it's important for where we're going to go. All right? But let's talk Samson. Again, one of the most 
well-known judges in the scriptures. Uh, he's known for his love for women. Samson had a love affair with sin that revealed itself through the lust of women. Now, when we think of Samson and we think of women, many of us think of Delilah. When we think about Samson's lust for women, that's where we go. But, but here's the thing, and we're going to see it in the text, that, that there were many women before Delilah. Judges chapter 16, verse 4, says this, Sometime later he fell in love with a woman named Delilah, who lived in the Sorek Valley. See, we are told that Samson fell in love. It's important. But it's not unusual for a man to do, especially for a man such as Samson. Some might say that Samson had a huge capacity to love. However, according to the book of Judges, we know that this is the third woman in Samson's life. Again, this is what we've been told. I'm pretty sure there were many more. But Delilah is the third woman in Samson's life. The first woman we read about is in chapter 14. She was from Timnah. She was a young Philistine woman. And that's all that we know about her. We are not told her name. We're just told that she's one of the daughters of Philistine. It says in Judges chapter 14 from verse 2 that Samson saw her and he wanted her. Finishing class. Let me read you these verses. He went back and told his father and his mother, I have seen a young Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as a wife. But his father and mother said to him, Can't you find a young woman among your relatives or among any of our people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines for a wife? But Samson told his father, Get her for me. She is the right one for me. Uh, the ESV translation puts it this way. Get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. What Samson is saying is, I want what I want. So give it to me. So you see, Samson is driven by his impulses, his lusts, and his desires. He's not driven by God. He's not coming to God and going, is this right? Should I do this? No, no, no. I want what I want. This way of living, friends, will destroy your life. It'll destroy your life. And, 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 and here's the crazy thing. I believe all of us know this. We know this. There are impulses in our lives that if, if we engage and if we respond to, they will kill us. It's like, it's like driving and responding to your phone. It just went deeper. Huh? Some of y'all are like, oh, how does he know? Because I know all of us do it. You know that it will kill you. But there is this impulse when, when you see the light, when you hear it vibrate, when you hear the noise, there's this impulse that goes, I've got to check. I've got to see. I've got to respond to that message. I've got to see how many people like my post. Friends, that impulse, when you're driving, it will kill you. Get her for me for she is right in my eyes. Now, now I know some of you might be sitting here going, oh, but Oni, these impulses are hard. They're hard to deny. I, just, I don't know if I can. If you are a child of God, you can. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says this, for God did not give us a spirit of fear or timidity, but a spirit of power, love, Self-control, discipline, wise discretion. There's, there's so many ways to put it, but, but essentially we're being told that we have been given a spirit that allows us to say no. And so we need to lean into the spirit in those moments. 
Because on your own, yes, you cannot say no. I know. I know you can't. But we have been given a spirit that speaks to our spirit that says no. Get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. This is the language of lust and possession. It's the language of a man who thinks women exist for his pleasure and that he has a right to any of them, any he so desires. Friends, there is no joy in this kind of a relationship. And if we read the rest of Judges, we see that the events that follow prove this to be so. There is no joy. There is no joy for Samson and there is no joy for us. It is only a temporary delight, but it fades quickly, and then you want the next thing. The next woman that we're told of is a prostitute from Gaza. We read about her in the beginning of chapter 16. She too doesn't have a name. Now, I think it's safe to believe that there were many prostitutes in Gaza. She is just one of them, one that we are told of. And again, Samson sees, he wants, and he takes. But this time, he digs into his pocket and he pays. That's the difference. He pays. This now sets the principle for what is to be expected. It is now a transactional relationship. She sells, he buys, he leaves. It's over in a night. And, and this is something I believe that happens over and over and over and over again. And it's important for us to hear this because we are not too different. The sin that you are partaking in it's costing you something. Don't be fooled. It is costing you something. Maybe your money, like Samson, but maybe your time, maybe your mental health, your physical health, your emotions, maybe your marriage, your children, your testimony, your legacy, it is costing you something. That's how powerful sin is. And then that's how it begins. I like, I want it. And then, and then sin gives you and, and gives you and gives you, and it's only temporary, so you want more and more and more. And then sin realizes, okay, now I've got you. I've got you at a point where now, hey, I want you to pay for this. And so now you pay and pay and pay. I say this often, and let me say it again. Sin will take you further than you want to go. It'll make you stay longer than you want to stay. And it will always, 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 always make you pay more than you can afford. Every single time. And for some strange reason, we, we, we live as if, oh, not me. That won't happen to me. I've got this under control. That is, that is a lie. You, you don't. You don't have it under control. And, that, and that's one of the reasons that we tend to keep this a secret. We don't want other people to know. How are you paying? keep going. The third woman, well, the third woman we all know. This time things are different. For the first time, the word love is used. And now here, what's also different is that we get a name, Delilah. So the word love is used, and now we have a name. 
But like many of the elements in Samson's narrative, the name Delilah, I believe, is, 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 is a riddle. It's a riddle, because um, etymologically, which is the study of words and their origin. I know some of you guys, you're sitting here going, he said what? The study of words and their origin would tell us that the name Delilah is of Arabic descent, which uh, means to flirt. And this is probably why most interpretations would say that, that Delilah, her name is temptress or, 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 or seduction or, or something along those lines. The reason I say that it's a riddle is because I don't know if parents would be naming their kids that. I don't know. But also, I think important for us to know is that the way that, that, that they would say Delilah, the, the way that it was pronounced, it, it, it had a, a similar pronunciation to, to, to saying of the night or darkness. Both these for Samson should have been dead giveaways. But Samson is in love. And what did I say a couple of weeks ago? Some of the most dangerous phrases that can come from our hearts and pour out of our mouths are, you do you. Do what makes you feel happy. Oh, but he's in love. Surely then it's fine. Be yourself. I get, I get what we're saying, but friends, there are times where it's like, no, don't be yourself. Don't, we, we full, we full of you being yourself. Just stop. Talking about names, what does Samson's name mean? It means son, S-U-N, or son child. What business does light have with darkness? Food for thought. But he's in love. Judges chapter 16, verse 4. Sometime later, he fell in love with a woman named Delilah who lived in the Sorek Valley. This time, Samson demanded nothing. He buys nothing. He doesn't come with money in hand. All he brings is himself. What has changed? He loves her. The progression of sin. It starts off with an impulse. I like it. I want it. And then over time, you find yourself now paying for it. And then, I'm in love. This is right for me. This is what I need. And that's all that Samson wanted. He, he wanted to love her and he wanted to be loved in return. And let's be honest, that's what we all want. Our hearts were made to love. They were made to be loved. There is no debate there, but the question is, where are you going for this? Darkness? Sin? I mean, Samson here is probably going here at last. A lasting relationship, potentially a marriage, a home, maybe a family. Samson's probably going, I've, I've, I've lived the so-called good life. I'm ready to now settle down with darkness. Friends, this is many of us. We don't realize that we trade sin for sin. It's the same thing. You... you you don't just need a renovated life. You know what, I've lived life, I've done it all, I've done the parties, the women, you know what, I, just, I, I wanna change things up a bit, you know, now, now I, wanna, I, want, I wanna do this right. How, oh, I'll just change a few things. No, 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 you don't need a renovated life. That, that, that's not what we need. We, we need Jesus to come and rip out the foundations and start anew. That, that's what the gospel is. The gospel is not Jesus comes into your heart and then moves a few things around. Oh, let me move this couch. It doesn't look right. No, no, no. Jesus comes in and completely takes over. And yet some of us have believed the lie that it's just, I just need a few things to change. That's it. And then I'll be okay. 
you trade sin for sin. Delilah doesn't love Samson. Nowhere are we told in the text that that is the reality. Neither does sin. We get way too close to sin thinking, no, we're we're buddy-buddy now. Sin, sin's desire is to destroy you. That's, that's sin's game plan. It's to destroy, and it, sin will do whatever, whatever, whatever it needs to do to draw you in and to get you to that point where you say, but I'm in love. This is right for me. Where everybody can clearly see you are destroying your life. No, guys, no, 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 no. Let me do me. Delilah didn't love Samson. She was ready to sell Samson into the hands of the enemy for 1,100 silver pieces per Philistine leader. Again, most of us would be familiar with the story. Delilah begins to work for her true love. And if you're still wondering, it's not Samson. Three times she asks Samson, for the source of his strength. And while in all three, Samson never really tells Delilah, with each one, he gets her a little bit closer and a little bit closer and a little bit closer. Go read the story. That's you and me. A little bit closer, I mean, how close can I get without getting burnt? That's the wrong question. The question should be, how far can I get without having to even recognize and realize that something is burning? No, no, this is us. But if it's like, is it really sin if I, yes. If, you, if that's how you start the question, the answer is yes. Is it, you know, but like if I go, is it, um, it if I, yes. Every time he gets her a little bit closer and a little bit closer until finally he tells her. Judges 16, from verse 16, it says, because she nagged him day after day and pleaded with him until she wore him out, he told her the whole truth and said to her, my hair has never been cut because I am a Nazarite to God from birth. If I am shaved, My strength will leave me. Listen to the detail. And I will become weak and be like any other man. When Delilah realized that he had told her the whole truth, she sent this message to the Philistine leaders. Come one more time, for he has told me the whole truth. The Philistine leaders came to her and brought the silver with them. Her mission is now complete. Sin's desire is to steal, kill, and destroy, and that is it, every single time. Her mission is now complete. Now, I've often wondered, why did Samson tell her? And the level of detail, like what? Why would Samson tell her the secret? I mean, he must have known to some degree that there might have been potential for her to shave. Uh, Let's be honest. He must have. The text tells us that Samson went to bed and even lay his head on Delilah's lap. Making it even easier for her to shave his head. Why? Why why would Samson do this? Well, the text gives us two reasons and I'm going to give you a third. It's not from the text. But when I unpack it, I think you'll agree with me. The first reason is because he loved her. You want to be transparent and vulnerable with the person that you love. I get it. You feel safe with the person that you love. Just because he loved her. But we're also told it's because she wore him down. She was nagging the whole time. Delilah, um, what are we eating for supper? So how, what source of your strength? De, de, um, Delilah, what's the weather like? The source of your strength? I mean, it just got to a point where it's like, I, ca- I can't, I can't. But here's the third reason. 
And I believe it to be true. It's found in the second part of verse 17, where he says, and I will become weak and be like any other man. See, being a Nazarite to Samson had now become a burden instead of a blessing from his point of view. And he wanted to be released from it. He wanted the ordinary pleasures of an ordinary man, a woman to love, a family to have, and a place to call home. At the end of all the battles that he had been fighting, I mean, was it wrong to want these things? Yes. Yes, it was. Now, let me be clear. Relationships, family, and a place to call home, these are not bad things. They're all good things. But they must be put in their correct place. And none of them, none of them can come above the Lord's call on your life. None of them. Samson had been called to be a Nazarite from birth, set apart by God for a purpose. A divine call for a divine purpose. And Samson had been well equipped for this purpose. We see this in Judges chapter 13, verses 24 to 25, where it says, So the woman gave birth to a son and named him Samson. And the boy grew, and the Lord blessed him. Then the Spirit of the Lord began to stir in him in the camp of Dan. He was fully equipped, set apart, fully equipped for that which God had called him to. And it was the same Spirit that was upon him when he killed the lion. In Judges chapter 14, or when he destroyed the Philistines at Ashkelon, and again in Lehi, God's hand was upon him. He was like no other man. He was like no other man. But Samson never really wanted what God wanted for him. One by one, he was discarding all the outward signs of what it means to be a Nazarite. He scraped honey from the carcass of a lion. Not supposed to touch anything unclean. He drank wine. The text tells us that he threw a party like young men did. And young men know how to throw a party. He handled the fresh raw jawbone of a donkey. He whined and dined with the Philistines and tried to intermarry with them instead of ridding Israel of their rule. Completely assimilated. He, he's like, I don't want this life. See, up until now, all that had been accomplished had been done because God used it all for good, not because Samson stepped forward in obedience. The only thing that he has really enjoyed about being a Nazarite is by being set apart as his incredible strength. And even, even that, even that now had become a burden. And he wanted to be released from it. He's tired of being holy. He's tired of being set apart. He, he wants to do what he wants. He wants to be like other men. That's why I believe he shares it all. Because deep down, Deep down, he's just like, I'm, I'm tired. I'm, I'm tired, God, I'm tired, I'm tired. You, you say that this is how I am to live. I am I'm called to be set apart. I am different. I've crossed the line of faith. But I'm tired because I'm, when I look to my friends who don't know Jesus, who don't love Jesus, it looks like they are living the good life. Why must I always do Why must I give, Lord? Why must I give generously? My friends don't give generously, and nothing is happening to them. You, you talk about judgment. You talk about, like, where is it? I, I don't see it. Look how they live. Lord, my marriage is difficult, and I want out. My friends aren't committed. It looks like they're having fun. I know that you've said one man, one woman, for the rest of, like I know you've said that, but I, I want out. 
And notice this, this is a real thing. I think sometimes we can, we can talk as if life is just, it's, it's easy and simple and great. How are you doing? Fantastic, life is good. But deep down, you're in pain, you're frustrated, you don't want to continue. And that might be you this morning. You've rocked up here this morning and you've just gone, you know what, I, this, is it. This, is, this is the last time. I can't anymore. I don't want, I don't want to be holy and set apart. I, I, I just, I want, to be, I want to be like everyone else. I want to live like everyone else. I'm done. I'm out. Friends, if, if that's you this morning, I want you, I want you to hold on. The reason that you're here is, I believe, to hear this very message and to be reminded of God's goodness and God's grace, that I know it's difficult. Jesus knows it's difficult. The scriptures tell us that, for we do not serve a high priest who's unable to sympathize with us. And yet in every way was tempted just like us. That temptation that you're experiencing, that you're going, I just, I, you know, I'm, I'm just going to give in. Jesus goes, I know. But it continues to tell us he did not sin. And that is why we can anchor ourselves in him. That we can lean into Christ, into his finished work. You are not alone. You are loved more than you could ever imagine. Hear me. Hear me. Don't, don't step out of your marriage. Don't give up on your kids. Don't walk away from the Lord. Hold on. Oh, but I can't. I've got no more strength. Yes, you don't. You have, you have zero strength. I'm telling you that now. But it's, oh, but aren't you supposed to encourage us? No. You have zero strength. This is why we hold on to the Lord. This is why we trust in him. Samson was just done. What happens when Samson opens up his heart to Delilah? Well, he, he gets his wish. But the exact opposite happens to what he anticipated. He, he thought, now I will be free. Isn't that what we tell ourselves? Oh, now, I'm out of, I'm out of this marriage, now, now I will be free. And I don't have to, no, like, no longer do I have to be obedient to what God has called me to. Now I will be free. I don't have to show up to the Sunday gathering. Now I will be free. I can watch whatever I want. I can drink as much as I want. Now I will be free. That's what he thought. He thought he would find freedom, but he found bondage and oppression. He becomes weak like other men. The Philistines capture him. And this time there is no way to escape. Why? Because his strength had left him. Judges chapter 16 from verse 19. Read with me. It says, Then she let him fall asleep on her lap and called a man to shave off the seven braids on his head. In this way she made him helpless. And his strength left him. Then she cried, Samson, the Philistines are here. He, when he awoke from his sleep, he said, I will escape as I did before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Friends, the, the author of history here wants us to also theologically see that Samson's strength was the Lord. D don't miss that. Do you see it? The Lord doesn't just give us strength. The Lord is our strength. Look at the latter part of verse 19. And his strength left him. And then we're told, but he did not know that the Lord had left him. Our strength is the Lord. Are you looking to be strengthened? Look to the Lord. But you might be here going, on oh, no. why would the Lord leave Samson? I thought the Lord will never leave us. Once in his hand, always in his hand. Isn't that what you say, Oni? Yes, yes, that's true. Once in God's hand, always in God's hand. I believe here, this leaving speaks to God's blessing over Samson. It speaks to God's blessing over our lives. 
And this is one of my deep concerns and worries for us as a church. Not, not just you, but me as well. We, we can get so comfortable with the mechanism of our religion that we no longer trust in the Lord. Let me say it this way. I know times are tough. I know that. Economically, politically, we're all uncertain. Immigration is coming out of our mouths more than often. I know. But let's be honest. When do we find ourselves complaining about the petrol prices? It's when we're at the petrol station filling up our cars. I'm not saying that it's not tough. Me too, I'm also like, ah, wait, wait, I'm telling the guy, stop, stop. You know, you, you get the uh, full tank. And then you're like, oh, but it's taking a while now. And then you look and you see numbers you've never seen before. And you say, no, please stop, stop, stop. Or we talk about how bad it is politically at the golf club while we're playing our ninth hole. Or when we're buying our cappuccino at our favorite coffee shop. Or when you're at gym. I know some of us in here, we're like, oh, no, but gym, gym is a need. No, gym is a want. You can run outside, can lift rocks. <laughs> but we have to go to gym. Swipe the card, everybody can see. Yeah, guys, platinum fitness. Let's, let's be honest. I know times are tough, I know. But friends, in this church, most of us, most of us have it pretty good. I bring that up because we can lean into those things way more than we should. Our resources, our accolades, our academics, our intellect, the house that we live in, the car that we drive, the spaces we go to, and believe we pulled ourselves up by our own bootstraps. And completely, completely forget the Lord. Here's a question. The way that you live would you even recognize if the Holy Spirit left? I ask that personally, but I'm also asking it as a church. Rooted fellowship. Would, would we even know, to, we, we come and we do the things. Put up the lights, put the pictures, the sound, the camera, everything. It's, it's, it's amazing here. But would we even notice if the Holy Spirit just left? Or would we just carry on and be like, ah, but you know, we... We drive our cars, and it not being for load shedding, we still have lights on. I think we need to, we need to do things differently. We need, to, we need to lean into the presence of God. We need to come to him and say, we are in desperate need of you. And money is a big thing for us. I bring it up, uh, not, not because I want your money, no. First of all, it's not your money. It's God's money. You think looting only happens out there? There's a lot of people in here who are looting. I talk about money because I know how powerful it can hold on to us. I want. Then I find myself paying for it. And it may not be you, but your kids, your relationships, your mental health, it's paying for it. Some of you are at jobs that you shouldn't be at. And you know that. And then all of a sudden, ah, but I love it. I love it. And so I wonder, I wonder, maybe here's a practice. This one's for free. Then instead of just setting up that debit order for those who give that way, as to every month, open up your laptop, open up your phone, look at that money, and then pray. Because I know what happens in here, and I know what happens in here. You look at that and you go, there are things that I could do with this money. And then you convince yourself, but they're good things. I could do good things with this money. And so pray. 
In, the, in that moment, you're going, I need, I need, I need the, the self-control, the discipline of the Spirit to be here. God, this is not mine, this is yours. I freely and generously and willingly give. God, you are my provider. You'll make a way. The Lord's blessing had left Samson. They capture Samson, they gouge out his eyes, they bind him and they take him down to Gaza to grind grain. What does sin do? Sin will blind you, it'll bind you, and it'll grind you. While Samson is there, probably wondering how on earth did I get you? God had so much more for my life and here I am. I'm being mocked, I've been beaten, I'm blind. He might think this is it, it's all done. But the text tells us that his hair begins to grow. Friends, I wanna tell you that that's the Lord's mercy. The Lord's mercy is like Samson's hair. God's grace grows new every morning, begins to grow. And so Samson cries out to God in Judges chapter 16, verse 28. He called out to the Lord, Lord God, please remember me, strengthen me. God, just once more, with one act of vengeance, let me pay back the Philistines for my two eyes. God restores his child. There in the dark and oppressive place, the Lord comes. Friends, call out to the Lord and he will answer you. None of us are beyond God's grace. Doesn't matter how dark it is, how bad it is, none of us, none of us are beyond God's grace. God is mighty to save. And so he calls out to the Lord and God comes and restores him. Samson then finally does that, what, that which he was set apart to do in the first place. He pulls down the temple of Dagon. And he begins the deliverance of Israel. And then the story ends, verses 21 to 30. That's the story of Samson. But here's the thing. He dies in doing this. And many have said that his death was glorious. Maybe. Maybe. I, I am left wondering how much more glorious could it have been had he just embraced his calling from the beginning instead of resisting it. That's the question I have. Friends, like I said, so much more could be said, but, but what's the point of all of this? Well, I, I hope you've been listening because the, the point is on every page. It's in every verse. Let me explain. I believe Samson is meant to reveal to the Israelites that they are Samson. See, Samson has a unique origin story. Israel has a unique origin story. Samson was a holy man. Israel was a holy nation, meant to be set apart. Samson uh, lusted after many women. Israel worshipped many false gods. Samson was so comfortable with his sin, so comfortable that he, he, he would put his head on the lap of darkness. Israel was comfortable with this, and they had assimilated. At this point, their eyes had just adjusted to the darkness. At his worst, at the bottom of his life, Samson called out to God to save him. At their worst, Israel cried out to the Lord, as we have seen again and again and again in the book of Judges. See, the, the, the Israelites would have been reading these stories and going, oh, Samson said, hold on, is that us? It's like the great reveal in a movie. I could say more, but you get the point. Samson's story is Israel's story but it's also our story. And his tragedy may be ours if we resist God's call, as Samson did. See, the Bible refers to us, to those who've crossed the line of faith as holy people. We're called saints. Now, I know you may not feel like one, but if, if you cross the line of faith, you're covered by the blood of Jesus, then you're a saint. And here's what Peter has to say about us. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, he says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you've received mercy. You're a holy nation. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 to 4, Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. To what? To what? To be holy and blameless in love before him. So the question for us is, will we embrace it? Will we embrace it? Will we find joy in it? All that God has called us to be. Or or will we be reluctant saints as Samson was? Always looking over our shoulder, wishing we could be as other people. To be led by our eyes in the selfishness of our hearts. There is another point to all of this, and I'll close on this. Where is the hope on it? Well, the story of Samson reveals to us that we are in need of a better judge. We're in need of a better judge. And for those who are on this side of Jesus' death and resurrection, we do have a better judge. See, Jesus had a unique birth, a miraculous one. Jesus had incredible strength over sin, death, and Satan. Jesus, like Samson, was betrayed by someone who acted as a friend and was handed over to the Gentile oppressors. He, like Samson, was chained and tortured and put on public display to be mocked. He, like Samson, dies with arms stretched wide. And through that death, when it looked like he was defeated, actually defeated the enemy. But unlike Samson, Jesus was not put in chains for his sin. He was chained for hours. Samson was a strong man made weak through his own sin. Jesus was a mighty God who voluntarily became weak to save us from the chains of our sin. We do have a better judge, and his name is Jesus. That's the good news, because we are all like Samson. We are all people who have been driven by our lusts, people who compromise over and over and over again, We are proud. We live for ourselves, and so therefore we are in desperate need of a Savior. And that Savior's name is Jesus. And so let me close by reading Isaiah 53, hoping that you would hold on to these words and believe in them, trusting that Christ has done it all for you, that that which was was promised was fulfilled. A better judge, the perfect judge. Isaiah 53 from verse 5 says this. I'm going to ask you to stand. We stand in, in honor of many things. We stand for kings and queens. We stand for politicians and leaders. We stand when the bride walks down the aisle. We should stand for the reading of God's word. And I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know if you're on the verge of giving up, giving in. I want you to hear hear these words and hold on to them. You're not alone. You are loved more than you can ever imagine. And the only reason that you can keep going is because he kept going. Maybe you're here this morning and, and you're not just in the lap of darkness, you're living completely, wholeheartedly in darkness. God is calling you. He's calling you to come out of that darkness into his marvelous light. God is the one who initiates. He's the one who stretches out his hand of grace towards you. In the pit of your darkness, he reaches out. He loves you. Stop listening to what everyone else says about you. Listen to what God says about you, and he loves you. He chose you before the foundation of the world. Isaiah 53 from verse 5, it says, But he was pierced for our rebellion crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We've left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as sheep is 
And as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream. But he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was, like, he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. And so Father, we, we ask that many, many, many would be counted in this number as your children. We thank you for Jesus' sacrifice. We thank you that he is the better judge He's the better king, the better prophet, the better priest. He's the perfect one. And so help us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And when we hear the lies of the evil one, as he whispers them in our ears, Lord, I pray that we would proclaim your word boldly, with conviction. It is true. We are no longer slaves. We are children of the kingdom of God, co-heirs with Christ. And every promise is yes and amen in Jesus. And so, Lord, I pray for every single heart in here this morning. I pray that you would convict, convict of sin, that you would shine your light in the areas of darkness, the places that we don't want people to know about, the places that we hide. We cannot hide from you, God. You see it all. And even though you see it all, you still call us to come. Our destination is the Father. And there's only one way to get there. Jesus said it. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The path matters. The destination matters and the path matters. And so keep us on that path, Jesus. We love you. We praise you. You are faithful. Amen and amen and amen.